the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I think it was about my early teen years that my favorite show on television was Wonder Years. And I have this recollection of an image from one of those earlier seasons where Kevin, the main character, was not much older than my son Elliot, maybe 11 or 12. And the story takes place up in uh, Long Island and uh, during a turbulent time, during the late 60s. But to these young children, it's just the way life is. And the scene is uh, probably a late summer day and he's had an incredibly difficult day and he's walking with his sweetheart, Winnie, uh, down the street and it's a considerable walk and they go to the neighborhood playground and they're on the swings, not really talking about much of anything but just kind of consoling each other almost without words uh, as children can do so, so perfectly. Uh, and then as the sun is setting, they're walking home and uh, Kevin's prized possession is his Jets, uh, looks like a letterman's jacket, his Jets jacket. Uh, and he notices there's a chill in the air and that uh, Winnie is cold and uh, in his innocence, uh, he takes off his, his jacket and he just puts it over Winnie's shoulder. Uh, and as you see, the sun set. Uh, and it's just a beautiful scene, but I realize how few times my son or daughter probably, even in Warrington, as safe as Warrington is, uh, would be walking down the street for several blocks to the playground and uh, much less on Long Island. Uh, but it reminds us how much fear has crippled us as parents. And I don't bring this up to judge our parenting as much as sometimes we see it more acutely in how we care for our children than we do in our own lives, the power that fear has in our lives. Fear really can be pretty crippling. Fear is incredibly powerful, and we don't realize that it's got its, its, its grips on us. Rome realized exactly how powerful fear was. Fear of death was the most important weapon that Rome had. With all of the lands, with all of the different peoples that Rome had conquered, with all of the occupied territories, Rome's troops, as mighty as they were, would have been, would have been made thin if they had to fight on every front. So they pushed that thumb down with fear. They realized the cross was a fantastic teaching device. Whenever anybody sort of rose up and threatened to galvanize people, the cross would remind them death is looming. Death has power. And so they would hang those insurgents on the cross so they wouldn't have to fight the battle. They could snuff out hope they could snuff out autonomy. They could make fear the most powerful weapon they had. And then comes Jesus. People wanted Jesus to conquer the Ro Roman territories. They wanted to take back Jerusalem. But you know, even if Jesus was that kind of leader, even if he overthrew all the power in Jerusalem, another power would have come in. And we still would be subject to fear. Jesus did. He removed the only thing that could hold people down. Fear. Fear of death. Fear of all of the different deaths in our life. Fear of the death of, of who people think we are. Fear of the death of the way that we see the world and that that might change. Fear of the things that are different. Fear of losing that financial security. Fear of breaking a relationship. Fear of standing up to injustice, all of those fears, all of those little deaths, Jesus conquered. The early Christians knew the power of that fear. They lived under the power of that fear, still under Roman rule. And Bishop Gulick started our Lenten journey on Ash Wednesday with this declaration from an article he'd read in the Christian Century uh, by the president of the Princeton uh, Theological Seminary, the line grew in his mind, you can't scare dead people. You can't scare dead people. People who have tasted death, 
who understand death has no dominion, no power, can't be scared. And the early church had to use that to its fullest. The only way to combat the power of Rome was to instill in every Christian the commitment that they were born again, that their life as they knew it had died and that they had faced death and were alive in something richer and fuller that couldn't be snuffed out. So their baptismal liturgy on the Easter vigil, as they'd gone through all of the preparation, they'd come into the church and they had to take off their, their garments. They had to take off the garments that they brought from their, their homes and they would go and they would wade into the water pool. And when they were there, the priest would say that they had died, that they were buried with Christ in Christ's death. And when they rose out of the watery grave, they would say, Christ has risen and you are alive in Christ. You have tasted death, and you see that it has no power. And then they put on a new garment. Because you can't scare dead people. And that's what the truth that we proclaim today is that we are alive in Christ, that we have a life that is sealed in love. Not the molecules bouncing against each other, but that we are love breathed into molecules that give us life that can't be snuffed out. And if we live as relentlessly, as fully, as joyfully, as lovingly as Jesus who walked to the cross, think of what might be possible. Think of the freedom that our life might, uh, might, might enjoy. There's a play that John Claypool, uh, who was a, a great Baptist preacher uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, actually, at the church just down the road, but uh, eventually he was so enamored with the Episcopal Church, he became an uh, Episcopal priest, uh, I had nothing to do with it, but uh, you know, I was very, uh, very, very proud to have known his son and, and to have seen the legacy he left in, in Louisville. But in one of his Easter sermons, he talks about a play. He said the play actually was kind of, uh, was kind of unpopular. It made a short run on Broadway, uh, but it was called Lazarus Laughed. And if you remember the story of Lazarus, who was raised from the dead after four days, a day after uh, that absolute definitive death. You know, three days they made sure that you were absolutely dead, but on the fourth day you were absolutely dead. And it starts with him being raised from the dead, and that's the first scene. And it's darkness, and he comes out of the tomb, and he's still in all of those burial uh, wrappings, those burial cloths, and he comes out, and his eyes are still adjusting to the light, and he sees Jesus, and he throws his arm around Jesus, and he sees Mary and Martha, and he hugs them, and his eyes are starting to come into focus, and it's not sort of a, a distant, starry glance. It is a very acute and focused look in his eye. And he looks down, and he touches the ground, and he looks up, and he sees the skies, and he sees the trees, and it's like he's seeing creation all over again for the first time, and he's yelling, yes, yes, yes. His life has a new energy. And he hugs all of those around him, and he's so filled with life and vitality. And finally, someone gets up the courage to ask him the question that's on everybody's mind. What's death like? What was it like to be in the ground? What was it like to be dead? And he laughs. Not a mocking laugh or a deriding laugh or even a loud laugh, but a soft laugh. And he says, there, there is no death. There's only life. The tomb is no more empty than a doorway is. It is a portal from this life to something beyond that where we continue to grow in the knowledge and in love of God, where we continue to walk towards the God that made us, the generous one that gave us life, that wanted us to be in the world. It is just more and more and more of that, of being in the presence of the same generous one who gave us life in the first place. And they kept asking him questions. And he kept explaining how this life was meant to be lived so fully out of love that when we walk into the next, it's so familiar. And then he went about life, and people noticed in Bethany that he was different, that even though he was doing the same mundane things, he did it with a lightness and a joy and in an enthusiasm that was contagious, his house uh, became the house where everybody gathered around. There was always dancing and singing, and the lights were always on. And he noticed uh, in Bethany that things started to change. 
that conflicts that had gone on for, for generations started to melt away, that people started to live with more hope and more joy and more love in their hearts. They weren't crippled by fear. Rome even started to notice. So they figured they better squash this out. Fear is their number one weapon. So they brought Lazarus in again, and they started to ask him, you've got to stop this, Lazarus, or we'll put you to death. And he laughed. And again, not a mocking laugh, just a gentle laugh. He says, there is no death. And Rome was taken back, and they said, well, what do we do now? And they sent him back and told him to behave himself, and then the things kept on going, and people kept on living a free and, and love-filled and joyful life. And they called him back to Rome again. And they said, you've got to stop. We are, this time we mean it. We're going to kill you. And he says, there is no death. There is no death. And the power that Rome had over their people was destroyed. Because you can't scare dead people. We are here not just because there's a promise, a glorious promise of what might come next after, after this life is lived, but because if we live this life <coughs> with the full joy, with the full acknowledgement that death has no dominion, that love is greater, we can live a freer, more joyful, more generous life. We can follow more faithfully the one who hung on the cross, poured out his love for all of us. Luke acknowledges that transformation, that sucking the power out of death and out of fear. Look at all the buts in the passage. They were afraid, but. They weren't sure if they believed, but. They told the disciples, and they weren't sure, but Peter went. We watch in the story as death looms so large, but in the end has no dominion, no power. So on this day, on this Easter day, I invite you, think of the fears that grip you, the deaths that you're afraid of, and trust that the tomb is empty, that there is no power greater than the love of God, and that if we channel that, if we walk out together as Easter people, as resurrection people, can be that house where the lights are on and people are singing and dancing and people realize fear doesn't control us. Love guides us. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.